I have about 19 slides and also a two-minute animated movie. And I love pressure, so uh, I will try to do this quickly, efficiently, and a lot will depend on whether or not my film works, because I spent a little bit of time with the technician that I'm waving to, and I'm counting on your uh, kind help uh, if, if we get stuck, okay? I'm going to uh, move fast. Uh, probably a lot of what I'm going to say is going to elicit questions, and I will love to, to talk with you uh, during, uh, during the break. Um, very, very quickly, Accus is a, uh, is a company. Uh, our headquarters are in Switzerland. I'm one of the owners of the company. Our research center is in Paris. We are not a startup company. We've been around for over 15 years, and we've been successfully bringing CO2 reduction technologies to the mobility market, specifically the, the automotive market. Um, Accus is uh, part of a, uh, a little group that includes a sister company. Accus is responsible for, doing, for creating technologies and business developing them, bringing into the market. As of 2016, we have also uh, created an, an asset management company. We've been certified by the French uh, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, and in the beginning of 2018, we'll be creating a private equity fund in order to accelerate the deployment of our hydrogen storage technologies. What I'm going to be talking about over the next uh, couple of minutes uh, is uh, our, our hydrogen storage technology and uh, specifically how we at Accus, because we're a business, how we are creating businesses around accessible technologies. A lot of uh, what uh, we have heard about yesterday and this morning uh, revolves around innovation that's probably going to be on the market uh, over the next five years. We at Accus, we can't wait that long. So what I'm going to be showing you here is how we are taking what is currently available, part of which we have developed, and how we're going to be able to leverage on the new usages that we see in the mobility and the energy markets to create sustainable businesses, and for us, sustainable means profitable. We cannot rely on government uh, subsidies to be able to uh, um, uh, continue to, to move these markets. Uh, as I've said before, uh, Accus is a company that has been focused on CO2 reduction technologies. We've been doing this for over a decade, and we've been doing it uh, through self-financing. We are three shareholders, uh, I'm one of them, and uh, to date we have not had to rely either on uh, uh, any outside equity, any bank debt, or government subsidies. We have a uh, geographical footprint that is very well matched with uh, innovation in the mobility markets. Our headquarters are in Switzerland. I'm in charge of the uh, research center, which is based in France. We have uh, affiliates, an affiliate in the United States, another affiliate uh, in Singapore. And we have offices. We have an office here in Israel that's run by Asher Segev. We also have recently put in place an office in Morocco in uh, China and, and very soon in Dubai for reasons that I will explain later. As I mentioned before, Accus is a company that is self-financed. We've been doing this for over a decade. Our business model is very much of a success-based business model, which means that if the technologies that we work on don't make it to market, then we have problems. Uh, and um, we are also very much IP-based. In, in, in other words, in order to bring a technology to market, you have to protect the technology. What that means is you have to be able to file patents and decide what part of your intellectual technology you're going to be protecting as patents and what part you're going to be protecting as, uh, as know-how, which means uh, uh, trade secrets. One aspect of our business model, and we think this explains our success, is that we do not do technology push. I'm a scientist at heart. I love technology. But what I've learned as a businessman is that if I enjoy uh, creating a technology and then try to find a market, then I'm going to very quickly lose my money. There's an old joke in Hollywood, which is, you know how you become a millionaire in Hollywood? Well, you start out with a billion dollars, and then very quickly you'll become a millionaire. We don't want to have to go through that, which is why we start with the market. In, the, in our traditional automotive market, we have worked 
with the automotive manufacturers to identify where they have technology roadblocks. We have then focused on which technology roadblocks are uh, pushed by regulations. Because in this particular industry, which is automotive, automotive companies, rightfully so, do not innovate unless they are forced to. Because as some of you may know, by the time an automobile is on the market, it has gone through thousands of engineering decisions. And there's a rule in engineering, which is when it works, when it's not broken, you don't fix it. Innovation means changing something that already works, and when you innovate, when you change one part of a system, there are always unintended consequences. And in the automotive industry, what you want to avoid are recalls, because they can be incredibly expensive financially and also in terms of reputation. So what we do is we start with the needs of the automotive manufacturers, we look at their product roadmaps, and then we look at which of those areas are impacted by regulations. And over the last 10 years, reducing CO2 has been the driving force in automotive innovation. What we do then is we look at whether or not there are technologies that exist in other industries. We have worked very closely with the aerospace industry to bring some of their technologies into automotive. If we do not find technologies that exist in other industries that have been validated, then what we do is we look at our network of private and public uh, labs, and then we finance this research. As an example, and this is leading me into the, the storage area, we are, have financed uh, a PhD thesis with a um, uh, French uh, technology institute that is specialized in powders. And uh, since a lot of the storage work and innovation that we've done revolves around using, intelligently uh, using powders to absorb gases, whether it be uh, hydrogen, whether it be other gases such as ammonia, uh, this kind of cooperation has been very, very useful for us. One of our big success stories, and this is where we are uh, uh, well known in the autom automotive industry, has been uh, around the, um, the whole area of um, uh, diesel emissions control. Why diesel? Because some of you may not know this, diesel has a, a bad reputation these days, but when you go from gasoline to diesel, you immediately reduce CO2 emissions by about 17%. And as an aside, this is one of the reasons that killing diesel uh, is a bad idea, actually, if what you want to do is meet the uh, COP21 Paris targets. And then I close my aside because I know a lot of people will jump up and down about that. What we did back in 2004 is that we uh, focused on ways to clean diesel emissions. Because yes, when you go from gasoline to diesel, you lower CO2 by 17%, but you increase the amount of particulate matter, you also increase the amount of uh, nitrous oxides that are, uh, that are emitted. We worked on diesel particulate filter solutions, and uh, starting in 2004, we worked on ways to reduce uh, nitrous oxide emissions, and at the time, the best available technology required incorporating into a vehicle a, what is now considered a strategic fluid, which is an ammonia precursor. Ammonia, for those of you who may, may know a little bit of chemistry, or I can remind you, ammonia can selectively catalyze nitrous oxides to convert dangerous nitrous oxides, dangerous for health, into uh, nitrogen uh, and uh, uh, other substances that you naturally find in air. So, uh, back in 2004, we uh, brought this approach to Plastic Omnium. Plastic Omnium uh, took the, uh, the, the challenge of working with us to downsize this technology that had already been integrated into trucks, that already existed in the stationary market, downsizing it, downcosting it, so that it could be incorporated into vehicles. What that meant was adding a new reservoir into vehicles, and in this reservoir you would have urea, or actually you would have an aqueous solution of 30% urea, 70% water. What that meant was that you were increasing the weight, the volume uh, in, in a vehicle, you were increasing cost. And what you were also doing, and this will resonate with, uh, with the hydrogen community, you were also um, at, addressing or rather bringing up an infrastructure problem. 
Because whenever you have a new fluid in a vehicle, you then have to be able to replace it once that fluid is gone. The uh, inconvenience of the uh, aqueous urea, or AdBlue, as it's marketed in, in Europe, uh, DEF, diesel emission fluid, as it's marketed in the United States, the inconvenience is that a filling station that would enable a passenger car to drive up and then at the pump refill with urea, each filling station required an investment of about 200,000 to 250,000 euros. Now this is a factor of 10 lower than the 2 million euros we're all familiar with when you're talking about a 700 bar hydrogen filling station. But the issue remains the same because with the cash flow that a filling station owner could generate from selling AdBlue at the pump to passenger cars, he could not get the kind of return on investment that he required. So with this innovation, we first began to uh, look at the constraints of infrastructure on bringing an innovation into a vehicle. What we did in 2008, since we now knew this market intimately, we began to look at how you could bring ammonia on board in a safe way. And one way of doing that was by absorbing the ammonia in solid materials, specifically different kinds of chlorine, chlorine uh, salts. And uh, this is a technology that we uh, developed. We have a portfolio of about 100 patents. And we licensed this in 2013. And this is now public, so I can say it. We licensed this to, to Plastic Omnium. With Plastic Omnium, we have gone through development since 2013. And now we are in pre-development with three automotive manufacturers. The uh, start of production dates that are being targeted are between 2019 and 2020. What you see here on the side is what one of these ammonia cartridges looks like. On the upper side over there, what you see is what the consumer will uh, experience. This is the first time that a driver will actually be uh, able to manipulate a cartridge. This will be an, an ammonia cartridge. The pressures in the ammonia cartridge at room temperature will be below one atmosphere which allows this ammonia cartridge to be sold in vending machines. The idea here, and this is something that we've explored with oil companies, is to be able to put vending machines, the same machines that you use to buy Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, and these ammonia cartridges will be in these uh, uh, vending machines. The investment of a vending machine is less than 10,000 euros as compared to the 250,000 euros you need to have AdBlue at the pump. So, this approach which we have validated in ammonia storage for emissions control is the same approach that, and let me make sure that this thing now will follow through, is the same approach that we have brought now to hydrogen storage. The basic idea for, what, for us is, as other companies have said, design once, deploy many times. The know-how that we developed in not only the technological aspects of absorbing ammonia into a solid uh, storage system, but also in terms of the whole ecosystem, in terms of the regulations, in terms of what is required to turn this into a business. This is what we've applied now to, to hydrogen. And what I would like to do here, if it will work, yes. In this animated feature, what we're doing is we're showing you our vision of the storage ecosystem that we want to put in place. Now, not all mobility applications are accessible with this kind of storage system, but you have certain stationary applications that are accessible. Here you have a typical storage cartridge that could be used, that can be sold inside a grocery store, that can be made available in vending machines. It is safe because it is very low pressure. It can be used in very small cars. It can be used in scooters. We have first generation scooters that we showed at the COP21 in Paris. We had ride and drive sessions. The idea here is to have an energy standard that this cartridge, which absorbs hydrogen, will be the new energy standard. And not only will it be an energy standard, but it will be available in the way that people use mobility or consume mobility these days. 
I'm probably one of the older people in this audience, but I know that my son, when he thinks about mobility, he no longer thinks about a car key. He thinks about an iPhone. He uses Uber. He uses different applications. If you uh, go to different big cities today, in Paris, for instance, you can use an app to buy mobility on electric scooters. The cartridges require a complete ecosystem. What you see here is the part of the ecosystem that centralize, centralizes the charging of the, the hydrogen cartridges. The cartridges also allow consumers to take part in the act of being green and in the act of being green when they move. Uh, and as other companies are, are doing, you look at what uh, companies such as Get is doing in Indonesia, the marriage between the new usage patterns and energy also allows many other applications to be put in place and allows many other ways of interfacing with, uh, with consumers. So I'm going to, I see uh, uh, that I need to, to move quickly. The key here is to see how new usage patterns with technologies that we have developed in terms of storage, technologies that offer significant advantages compared to what we see coming onto the market, and here you have a comparison of our three generations of storage technologies, and you see that our second generation, which is, as we look at it, applying our ammonia uh, uh, storage uh, know-how to hydrogen, allows us to have significant gains compared to lithium-ion batteries for these kind of applications, especially when you're looking at being able to remove the lithium ion battery to be able to recharge it. Here what you're looking at is the gain in weight and the gain in volume when you're using hydrogen cartridges. We have fuel cell partners today, and one of the reasons I was interested in the presentations yesterday and this morning is that we are looking at fuel cell partners to see what is going to be required over the next five years. We have an IT platform that we're developing to be able to Interf have consumers interface with the whole ecosystem, and we are deploying storage in five geographical areas. 2017 and the beginning of 2018 are the time periods in which we are screening the local partners, but we have signed agreements with the city of Marrakesh as well as the region and the Minister of Energy. We have a signed agreement with uh, Dubai South, we have a signed agreement with the economic zone of uh, Jiangbei, as well as with the Chinese partner who manages 40% of all of the gasoline filling stations in China. And we're looking at deploying our storage technology in the um, uh, region between uh, France and, uh, and Switzerland. The applications we're targeting are applications that are accessible with these cartridges and accessible with present fuel cells. The idea being to create a business model that will be profitable so that it will be durable, so that we don't have to rely always on government subsidies. A lot of people ask us, well, where does your hydrogen come from? We are agnostic in terms of where the hydrogen comes from, but we are very focused on green hydrogen. This explains our choice of Morocco for one of the launch areas because Morocco has, as a country, taken a huge, very ambitious goal in terms of renewable energies. And so they are asking us to integrate the uh, storage ecosystem into the renewable energy uh, uh, production in, in Morocco. And finally, what is also very important for us is to localize, to find local manufacturing partners, because we think this is the best way for us to be able to have a cost system that is adapted to the purchasing, uh, local purchasing power. Thank you very much.